and welcome to everyone. Um, we're really happy to have you joining us this evening. This is the fourth and final webinar in our series celebrating spring migration at Whitefish Point. Um, today we're going to be talking about pygmy plovers. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to cover a few logistics with everyone. So there are two ways you may be joining us this evening, either through Zoom or through Facebook. And um, we're really happy to answer any questions that you have. We'll save those to the end, but you're welcome to submit them at any time. Um, to submit those questions through Zoom, you can do that through the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen um, or through the comments section on Facebook. And I'll monitor those throughout the presentation and at the end, we'll try to answer as many as possible. So this program is being recorded and it will be available for viewing once it's complete. Um, the video is available immediately after um, on our Facebook page. So as soon as we're done, it'll be available for replay, but we'll also get it uploaded to our YouTube channel um, sometime next week. So if you're watching a recording of this presentation, or if you have questions at a later time, you can always send those to us at the Michigan Audubon general email address at birds at michiganaudubon.org. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the final webinar in our WPBO series. Um, we've been celebrating spring migration at Whitefish Point and talking about all the great research and monitoring efforts that are ongoing. Um, we previously covered the owls of Whitefish Point, Raptor ID and Waterbird ID. Um, we did record all of those presentations as well. So if you missed one of those, um, or if you wanna watch any of them again, you can find them on our Facebook page or through the Michigan Audubon YouTube channel. So Whitefish Point is a program of Michigan Audubon. Um, also known as WPBO, it's, it has been monitoring and documenting the migration of tens of thousands of birds that funnel to the point every spring and fall for over 40 years. So if you're interested in learning more about the history of WPBO, what's going on at WPBO, reading field staff blogs that are all current um, or past, um, or watching the live count data via Dunkadoo, you can do that all through our website at WPBO.org. So um, welcome again to everyone who's joining us. We're really happy to have you. Uh, today we're gonna be learning more about the endangered piping clover. Um, so we're really lucky to have with us Jillian Farkas of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, she's going to discuss these really special birds. So thank you, Jillian, for joining us, and I will hand things over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to talk to you guys about the piping plover. Um, I am the Great Lakes Piping Plover Coordinator for Fish and Wildlife Service. I just started in January of 2020. Um, and so it's been really a blast getting to know more about these birds and I'm happy to answer any questions um, at the end of the presentation or during. So feel free, Lindsay, let me know if there's any pressing questions and thanks so much. So this is a piping plover for those of you who have not maybe seen one in real life. They are present throughout the Great Lakes Basin. Um, they are a small shorebird. Their back is kind of the color of sand. It's to help kind of blend in. They have this thick black band around their neck in their uh, breeding plumage, as well as this dark black line connecting between their two eyes. Um, the males tend to have this really defined black line on their, their beak that separates um, the orange from the black. Uh, the females, it tends to be a little bit more faded, um, but these are some uh, characteristics for the piping clover. And as you can see, they have um, a bunch of jewelry on their legs. These bands help inform us of which bird it is. Um, and it's really informed our, our recovery process as well. So to kind of get an idea about what size piping plovers are, they're bigger than a chickadee, um, but smaller than a robin. So um, they are typically 55 grams at most, anywhere between 40 to I think 60 grams they can be. Um, but they're smaller than what you may expect. So they have this white stripe along the wing is kind of an identifying characteristic as well as a white tail base with these dark tips at the bottom. And they also have this dark upper wing. They have breeding and non-breeding plumage. Um, so this is in fact the same bird. So up in the Great Lakes, what you'll see or what you would see at Whitefish Point would be an adult in this breeding plumage. So again, you can see this thick band around the neck, this thick band between the eyes, it's very distinct bill. Um, however, if you were to head down um, to the Carolinas or Georgia, or maybe some, sometimes in Texas or down in Florida, 
um, you would potentially see this kind of breeding or this, this plumage. So it's different. It's gray and white. They don't have those distinct markings. The legs aren't as vibrant and orange. Um, so they're unique in that sense. Piping plovers have, um, they're almost like angry little football shorebirds that are just trekking along the beach. They enjoy uh, pecking and running and they kind of feed along the shoreline. Um, they do fly along the shoreline, but you're most likely to see them scurrying, scurrying around on the sand. So males and females, you can distinguish between the two just based on um, visual cues. So males typically have a thicker dark band around the neck, um, this distinct line again, um, marking on the beak, as well as um, this black band in between the eyes that connect the eyes versus females on it. Normally, there's always exceptions to the rule, um, have a thinner black band around their neck, not as distinct of a black band between their eyes, not that distinct line on their beak. Um, this, can, this can be hard at the beginning of the season because not all of the breeding plumage may have changed. And so you may see males that kind of have beaks like this, but eventually look like the image on the left. Um, so it's, it's clear to kind of see the differences between male and female. However, there's always exceptions, exceptions to the rule. So again, we have a male on the left, but right away you might think that this image on the right is also a male because a thick black band, it's not as a faint as the previous image, but this is in fact a female. So that's why it's also helpful to have the banding combinations to really determine what individual it is and what um, sex it is. So this is a juvenile piping plover. Um, they look like the non-breeding adult piping plovers. They have a black bill, orange legs. Again, they're not having that black neck band or the forehead band and kind of have this light edging on feathers. So um, we'll typically start to see these looking birds by maybe as early as the end of June. Um, all the way till August, or if it's a late brood until um, September. Some birds that people confuse piping plovers with um, are semi-palmated plovers. Um, semi-palmated plovers have more of a cinnamon backing, kind of have more of a mask, um, but otherwise they are kind of similar looking, but make sure to look for that mask on the beach. We do get a lot of observations or notes about killdeer. So killdeer have double bands around the neck. They tend to have slightly longer legs and more of an elongated beak. Um, and I think that personally, I think that they have a bigger eye than what piping plovers have, but we do get a lot of reports about um, killdeer believing that they're piping plovers, but um, just slightly different. We also get some observations that you might see out on the beach are spotted sandpipers as well. Um, more elongated, they have the speckled um, breast, but they're also a shorebird. So some people think that they also might be piping plovers. So there are three um, populations for piping plovers. We have about seven to 8,000 pairs globally um, and they're global, globally rare. So we have our Great Plains region, which is over here on the left, going from uh, Canada all the way down to Nebraska, um, which, so that's a distinct population segment. We have our Great Plains population over here that goes from Wisconsin, um, Illinois, Indiana, historically, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, as well as Canada, the Ontario area. And we also have an Atlantic coast population um, on the east side. So um, typically we do not see breeding amongst the populations. There's always, um, there can be an exception. We have had a pair, um, a Great Plains bird and a Great Lakes bird breed in Minnesota. We've also had a Great Lakes bird breed over on the East Coast, but it's very uncommon to see that. So um, here are the breeding and non-breeding wintering locations for um, summer 2020 to summer or to winter. <laughs> so you can see like the blue dots and the yellow dots indicate um, observations of our breeding population. And then you can kind of see where they are spending their time wintering. We get a lot of observations from Georgia as well as the Gulf of Mexico. So along this Florida coast, we get occasional observations from Texas. We had um, our famous, famous Chicago plover, Monty was hanging out in, in Texas this year. Um, and we have it along um, in the Carolinas. So they, we've had weird, weird, weird birds out. And, oh my goodness. I can't catch my breath today. So we've had weird birds out into Cuba occasionally, even the Bahamas, as well as the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. So they're, they're traveling, they're traveling all over. 
historically in the Great Lakes, we had maybe 500 to 600 pairs. Um, however, in the late 1980s, it really condensed down to as few as 12 piping, player, piping plover pairs. And in 2020, these are where the, the breeding locations were. Um, since 2017, we've had breeding on all five Great Lakes um, up in New York and in Pennsylvania, um, again, in, in Ontario. Uh, a lot of our piping plovers are um, around Sleeping Bear, but we've had pairs up in the UP and Wisconsin and Monty and Rose in Chicago. So how did we go from 500 to 600 pairs down to as low as 12 pairs. So the Great Lakes birds nest only on the Great Lakes. They are the smallest and most, um, most endangered of all free populations. And since 1986, when the Great Lakes piping plover population was listed, um, a big team of federal, state, um, NGOs, individuals came together to help bring this bird back from extirpation. So, they, because they're shoreline specialist species, they tend to overlap a lot with um, anthropogenic issues. Additionally, they only have one clutch of four eggs each year. They're, I know that like um, bluebirds, they can have two clutches of eggs, they can have two um, broods in a year, but piping plovers typically, or they only have one. They might re-nest if they lose a, a nest to an appredation event or to a washout. Um, but at most, we typically see four chicks fledged. Um, piping plovers may have as few as one egg, um, and they have, we've had up to five eggs in a single brood, but four is typically the standard. So it's not, it's not like a clutch, like a chicken, just popping out an egg all summer. It's, it's only four. So we've also seen back in the 1900s, there was a large um, want for feathers for decoration purposes. So um, people knew where piping plovers would nest, they would always be at the shore, and so they were an easy target for people to go hunt. But the Lacey Act and the Migratory Bird Act all helped to um, help prevent more of this kind of take from occurring. Another reason for decline is shoreline development. There's been rapid industrialization of certain areas that overlap with the piping plover. Um, including congo, condos being um, erected along shorelines, um, putting in jetties in on beach habitat that make it um, take away some of the habitat that piping plovers use to breed. Um, so it just makes it a little bit harder for piping plovers to flourish. There's also been increased beach recreation along um, the breeding grounds as well as the wintering grounds. Um, the bottom left picture is in Texas. You can drive your cars out onto the beach, which make it really hard for um, shorebirds in general to forage. Um, people tend to want to take their pets out on the beach and there might not be proper signage to show that they need to be leashed or pets shouldn't be at the beach and that can deter um, feeding as well. Another reason for population decline is an increase in predator populations. Um, predators have been increasing from historic levels. Um, we've seen an increased amount of crows while gulls have Kind of been declining. Um, we also see um, different mesopredators, including raccoons. We see some foxes, and we also have different avian predators, including uh, merlins, that are impacting our piping plovers. So, so many things that are impacting our piping plovers. What are we doing to try to recover the species? Oops. We have, like I was mentioning, a multi-partner recovery program. We work with numerous land management agencies as well as zoo organizations and research institutions as well. Um, and many land protection and monitoring support, including Audubon and TNC. And so it's really a huge um, effort by many partners that have come together over the years to try to recover the piping plovers. Not only are they um, federal, state, local partners, there's also a lot of volunteer efforts that come in. So we have a lot of bark rangers that help um, inform beachgoers to have their dogs be on leashes, or we have people informing us, hey, we've seen a piping plover in this area, um, and landowners being allowing us um, to put up exposures on areas um, that are private land. So it's really a huge effort um, by everybody. 
So the recovery plan for the Great Lakes piping plover population was created in 2003 and has five major um, recovery criteria. And so we're aiming to have at least 150 pairs for five consecutive years with 100 of them being in Michigan and 50 being in other Great Lakes states. So where we're at right now, um, as you can see, we started out really low in 1984, around 12 pairs. We had them listed. We started to use exposures to be able to um, try to minimize predation events. Um, we started a captive rearing program in the 1990s, and we also started doing some predator control efforts. And so we've gradually kind of seen this increase in the population. Uh, ebbs and flows as all wild populations do, and it also corresponds with we believe the levels of um, the Great Lakes, the water levels. And so we've recently seen a little bit of decline, but those also have been historically high um, levels um, in the Great Lakes. And also the pandemic kind of threw a wrench in some of our monitoring plans. We weren't able to get out as early as we wanted at all of our sites and um, trying to be safe and minimize um, contact. We didn't necessarily have as much of a monitoring presence as we've had in the past. So we had 64 pairs last year. Um, but that might be an underestimate of the true number. So kind of looking at what um, our nesting pairs are by location. So the solid colors, I know this is a little bit of an over overwhelming graph. Um, the solid colors indicate Michigan nesting birds, which um, primarily make up our piping clover population. And last year we had 20 of our 64 uh, pairs be outside of, of Michigan. So sleeping bear, which is all red, is the stronghold for our piping plovers currently. Um, we've had birds up at Whitefish, um, up in Vermilion, Grand Marais. We've had it at different state parks, including Silver Lake State Park. We've had Ludington State Park in the past. Um, High Island, we work with um, different tribal organizations to um, help monitor piping plovers on certain islands, as well as um, we've had birds at TNC properties as well. So we also saw a few birds in Wisconsin. Um, we had a pair in Illinois. We had two pairs in Pennsylvania. We had several pairs in Ontario and one pair in New York. So we're slowly making our way towards 150. 64 is slightly less than 150. Um, but I'm expecting that we'll see um, a jump this year um, based on lower lake levels, um, as well as kind of a plan in place dealing with the pandemic and doing monitoring. Another recovery plan criteria is having 1.5 to two fledglings per pair for five years. And so these numbers are kind of estimated to help um, show that our population is moving in a positive direction. So on our left, we have our chicks fledged per pair. And then um, on the bottom, we have the, the years. And so the orange line is um, our total fledged per pair. And our blue line is the wild fledge per pair. We do, um, the Detroit Zoo has led a phenomenal captive rearing program um, since the early 90s, which has helped contribute captive reared chicks to the population. And so last year we had an overall fledge rate of nearly two, so 1.97 chicks per pair when we included our wild and captive population. And it was only 87 chicks um, that were fledged with um, in the wild. We had a record breaking year last year. Um, with captive reared individuals, it was 39. I think the last highest number of chicks that we've ever fledged, I think it was around 24. So we um, had a phenomenal year and that was great because due to the pandemic, we didn't even know if we we're gonna be able to have a captive rearing program. And this year we're seeing, we've seen 13 um, captive reared birds this year from 2020, which is nearly a third of the captive reared birds that were released. and um, that's almost on par with the wild fledged chicks that are returning. So it's it's really inspiring to see. And one of our, our pairs up in uh, Sleeping Bear, there are two captive chicks from last year that have uh, nested at a spot that hasn't been nested at in the past 20 years. So it's very exciting. So we're, to go back really quick. Um, so we've been meeting that criteria of 1.5, that red line for the past several years, and we include that, that captive population. So we also aim to have protection and long-term maintenance of essential breeding and wintering habitat. So we have critical habitat units throughout the Great Lakes region. Critical habitats um, designations are made by fish and wildlife biologists to ensure um, that we can meet recovery goals. So 
Um, it includes specific geographic areas that are essential for the conservation of threatened or endangered species. And they might require special management consideration and protection. So at the time of designation, they don't necessarily need to be occupied, but it needs to have a justification for why it needs to be included. So we have this also in the wintering range. So we aim to have these, um, the piping plovers nested in 95% of the critical habitat units um, or of the nests, 95% were then critical habitat units. So they are, they are using them. So we also aim to have genetic diversity in the population to ensure it's adequate. We've done several genetic um, studies. We've done mouth swabs and we're starting to do uh, fecal samples to determine different genetics. Um, we haven't noted really any genetic bottlenecks. And I don't know if it's because of the slight influx of an occasional Great Lake or Great Plains bird or historically um, what that overlap was, but we're not seeing um, the genetic implications that you normally see with um, like black-footed ferrets or some other populations that got to really low numbers. Our last criteria is making sure that we have agreements and funding mechanisms in place um, for long-term protection and management activities for the piping plover. So um, they are conservation-reliant species, and so it will require still a lot of efforts from partners, even if they are um, delisted, and we need to ensure that there's agreements and funding mechanisms in place. So we banned our piping plovers and the other regions, the Great Plains and the Atlantic coast, they don't always um, banned all of their birds or we've done it for a really long time. And that's helped inform um, mate and nest site fidelity. It's helped inform mortality rates. It helps us determine migration routes um, as well as sex ratios at hatching and also helps inform management practices to increase our population viability. So we do ban our chicks. We typically wait when they're still young, typically at least a week old, and they each get a brood marker as well as um, a USGS band and additional color bands. They don't get typically the orange flag that you can see on this adult because it's a little bit too uh, large for their bodies at this point, but they do get an orange band with a, a color, either red, orange, or red, blue, green, or yellow. We do banned adult clovers. Occasionally we'll get an unbanded adult. Um, again, they get this USGS band, they get color bands, and we um, solder the bands to make sure that nothing can get caught inside of them um, or they get snagged on things. So this helps minimize um, concerns about that. So my, the banding also informs like migration, like I was saying, to be able to see um, where they're going, who's going where, and how fast that they're getting there. So we have this bird. Not all of our birds have quirky names like Monty and Rose. Sometimes it's just how we read the band combination. So um, this bird was at Sleeping Bear Dunes. It was observed by a monitor at 10.15 in the morning. And then two days later, it was observed in Miami. And so not even two days, this was less than 44 hours or 45 hours. It had traveled almost 1400 miles. And as the crow or as the plover flies, um, they had to have averaged 31 miles per hour to get there, which I think is phenomenal or just not stopping along the way. And there's still a lot of questions that we have about um, their migration routes. And that's why it's so important to have observations from uh, citizen scientists along the way, just to be able to see who's stopping where. Last year, we had someone stop in the Ionia Fairgrounds. It was a little early. Um, the, the fair wasn't happening yet. And we had an observation this year about a stopover in Tennessee. And so we don't, um, know how long that they stop. I don't think it's a, a long migration period for them, but it can be quite quick, which I thought was really cool. And we wouldn't have known that if we didn't ban the birds. So a uh, monitor that we hire monitors throughout the Great Lakes um, Basin. We typically, our partners will hire monitors and we have monitor a monitor at Whitefish Point as well as um, eBird observations. And so typically what they're looking for, um, this is kind of what we, we do. So in April and May, these crazy birds can come back even when there's snow um, or even <laughs> ice still on the Great Lakes. They're hardy birds, um, so I don't know quite what they're eating um, during this time, but they're able to find something. The males typically are the first to come back, um, the more established males, and then typically followed by the more established females. Um, and then we start to see the less established males and females start to arrive, and then we start to see the um, first year breeders come back. So we're still starting to have trickled in um, the captive bird birds, the um, first year 
wild chicks that are starting to arrive after everyone else has. Well, monitors are starting to look for piping clover tracks. There's these C formations, they're kind of pigeon toed. Um, so they'll typically be scattered all over the beach. And so we're looking for these kind of tracks to try to track down piping clovers. We start to sleuth out who's kind of pairing with who, um, what are their territories, what are they establishing, um, who's kind of pairing up where, and we're starting to figure this out in April and May before there's actually nests. So we kind of know where they're hanging out and where they might be nesting and looking for scrapes. The piping clovers are territorial. They have flight displays. Um, they might fight and that saying like, this is my area. Um, so that can also give you information about kind of where they're hanging out and where they're potentially going to be nesting. So monitors are on the look for this. You can see territorial disputes. Sometimes on the left, they'll walk side by side, like um, trying to pair each other up. We're trying to see, okay, can I take you on? Um, otherwise, they, I've seen this several times where they're kind of hunched over and they'll chase each other off. Um, and they're just trying to maintain their territory. This is the kind of piping clover habitat that is typical um, that we're looking for with nesting. They typically like large swaths of beach that aren't super close to tree lines, as well as kind of this cobble um, that helps them camouflage in with the sand. During piping clover season, you need to be very careful where you're walking. The eggs uh, look like beautiful round stones. And so you need to be very conscious of where you're stepping. And this is almost um, a nightmare because you don't want anything bad to happen. But typically the parents will be telling you if you're getting too close to the nest. We start to close the areas with rope fencing. If we see a nest, we have these signs saying they're closed or um, a piping clover nesting area. And that way it just gives the birds more protection. It alerts the public um, not to go in these areas and as well as just kind of a high alert to make sure that pets aren't in there and just trying to give the, the piping clovers the least amount of stress throughout their breeding season. So then they'll start to pair up and you'll start to see a couple couple individuals hanging out together. And so we can tell who's who by their bands. Um, the males will start scraping. So you'll kind of see these indentations and in the sand. Um, and they might have a couple throughout its territory and it's trying to show the females where to lay the eggs. And so these scrapes you can see um, on the left, they kind of blend in, but typically you'll see like on the right, you'll see a lot of um, piping clover tracks like around these nest scrapes as well. Then the male will start to do a tilt display over the female as part of the courtship. Um, this image in the top right is two confused males. I think that they didn't know that one or the other was not a female. So sometimes uh, you'll see that on occasion, they get confused too. Um, they'll also do as a courtship display, they'll do a goose step, um, which is a really interesting behavior. And I have a link to our um, Piping Clover website that shows video clips of these behaviors, which is kind of fun to watch. Looks like they're marching. And then they'll copulate. Um, they can copulate a couple of times um, before laying an egg. And then typically after copulation, um, it will take around a week um, to lay an egg. And so adults will also potentially do a broken wing display, um, similar to what you may see in killdeer as well, um, trying to say, get away from my nest. So they'll do this display. So after the copulation and all these behaviors, we have a nest. And so they, the piping plovers typically will lay eggs in a sparsely vegetated beach area. Um, there can be three to four eggs. Um, and like I was saying, maybe up to five, depending on the pair. Um, the piping plovers lay their eggs every other day. And so it takes about eight days on average to have a full clutch before they start incubating the eggs. Both males and females share the duty of incubation. Then they'll incubate the eggs for 25 to 31 days. And we typically see it um, for 26 to 28 days um, before they hatch. And they may renest if the initial clutch is lost. So these are what the nest looks like. Uh, the males will typically start to add cobble on the inside. Um, but they blend in quite well. After we find a nest, we will put up an exposure. Um, this is a mid-size exposure. We also have minis that sometimes we use, but ultimately we use mid-size to um, minimize 
impacts of predators on our nests. Then we have our chick rearing period, um, these cute little cotton balls with uh, two thick legs. Um, so this isn't a mutant piping plover. This is actually a bunch of the chicks that are, are hanging out with the adult. For the first 10 days or so, they can't really thermoregulate themselves. Um, so they typically are hanging out with their parents and getting the body heat from their parents. It can be quite difficult to find and count piping plover chicks. Um, I don't know if y'all can, can see how many chicks are here. And this is when they're all standing still. Um, sometimes it's hard to see the chicks. Um, or it's hard to see until they start <laughs> moving sometimes, but they have such good camouflage and they, they blend in. So I don't know if people give a couple more seconds. It was more than what I thought. So there's 14, there's 14 chicks here. I know I always, I think I always miss this one right here, but they can be really hard to find. They're really good at, at camouflaging. And so with chick development, they are precocial. And so they come out and they're read, ready to go. They start feeding themselves. The parents aren't assisting with feeding. Um, they grow up quite quickly. Um, so this is day one and day six, day 11, day 15 day 24. So at day 24, we consider them uh, fledged. They do still have these uh, downy tail feathers. You can kind of see still some of their downy feathers, but they can fly. So we do consider them fledged at that age, and that helps us determine that, that fledge rate, that 1.5 to um, fledge rate. Um, and then this is at 30 days. So this really starts to look like that wintering plumage or um, the juvenile piping clovers that you'll, you'll see. So with captive rearing, there's, um, we have abandonment and salvage protocols. Sometimes our eggs and our nests are too close to the water, they get washed out, or there's a random storm event, um, or unfortunately one of our adults goes missing and the other adult abandons the nest. And so we are fortunate to work with the University of Michigan Biological Station, as well as the Detroit Zoo um, to help have a captive rearing facility. So since 2001, the Detroit Zoo has been coordinating a multi-zoo effort to manage the captive rearing of piping clovers, and it's also collaborated with zookeepers around the country um, to help rear and release nearly 300 piping clover chicks. So this is at UMBS. So these are a couple of pictures of um, inside our captive rearing facility. Um, this helps, uh, this egg buddy helps determine uh, if the eggs are fertile. We weigh them to see how their weights are changing throughout development. If there's anything concerning, there's only a certain amount that it should fluctuate within um, a week. Um, over here, you're seeing the venation within the egg. That's with candling. We're able to see that it is a viable egg. Um, and so that means that we, if we're out in the field, we'd wanna get it to the captive rearing facility to um, start incubating. And so this is inside one of the incubators they're on rotating, um, the incubators help rotate the eggs to uh, ensure just uniform incubating. And so if everything goes right, we get um, a bunch of piping clover chicks. And so we have a protocol to try to minimize the disturbance. We have curtains up, we play Great Lakes noises. We have the waves crashing, occasionally a predator will call. Um, we have the we don't have adults helping incubate, but we do have um, this upside down duster so to kind of um, be a parent. And so we try to group them with similar age chicks. Um, and so currently our model is having the Detroit Zoo raise the chicks. We bring the eggs to the Detroit Zoo to raise. Um, after 10 to 14 days, we're able to bring the, the chicks. Those are just like the really crucial hard times. And then we're able to bring them up to the biological station where we work with um, Dr. Francie Cuthbert and her crew helps um, raise the chicks to fledging age. So this is the piping clover building at the biological station. And this is their flight pen. So they get real life experience. We try to make them hardy birds so they don't just get to stay in the hotel uh, chateau piping clover um, with constant uh, temperature, no, no rain. So they're able to kind of forage in the lake. Um, they're able to get kind of some flight experience. And we also um, have them out in the elements. So 
they're able to experience storm events. Um, and some pullovers just really love hanging out in the rain. So we try to put them through through the rigor to be um, to be great piping plovers and, and try to ensure that they're going to come back the following season. So we transport them in these cat carriers and release them at a site that typically has um, similarly aged chicks that are a wild population. So in 2021, so right now, as of today, with piping plovers, we currently have 50 pairs and 56 nests currently throughout the Great Lakes region. Um, we're still expecting additional pairs and nests. We're still um, seeing a lot of captive reared individuals come back. We're seeing those first year um, birds come back. So we're, we're right on schedule. If not, we were ahead of what we were last year. So we're currently seeing nesting on all five uh, Great Lakes. And something very exciting that's happening today is that we um, have observed piping plover breeding behavior in Ohio. So we've seen copulations today, territorial displays today um, outside of Toledo. And if they do in fact breed, it will be the first time in 83 years that we've had a nest in Ohio. So it'd be an amazing success. And I think that that just speaks to us slowly recovering the piping plovers, um, increasing their population that allows them to um, spread out throughout their historic range. And they're currently nesting on government, tribal, private land, and they've also nested in NGO land in the past. And we're on track to have many nests um, to start hatching in this first week of June, the first couple of weeks. So um, keep your eyes out along the shoreline for the cotton balls, the toothpick legs. And so how you can help um, with piping plover recovery, um, when you go to these coastal environments, just be mindful to try to share the shore. Um, piping plovers are, interesting birds. Some are quite hardy. Some like to nest next to the ORV area at Silver Lake. Um, some want to nest on an island and have nothing to do with any people and so they can be really skittish, but um, try to give them their distance so they don't get stressed. Um, observe birds from a spotting scope or a pair of binoculars. And if you are on uh, an area where piping clovers may be, keep your dogs on leashes that can really help um, the piping clovers and just trying to give the shorebirds space in general. If you do see a piping clover, we'd love um, to hear about it because sending observations to um, glpippledata at gmail.com. So that is um, kind of informs us if there's a new observation. We also look to eBird. So we see a lot of eBird observations um, and that's able to help inform us where we're seeing some birds. And if they're really great pictures, we're able to even see the band combinations and kind of track and see we're seeing who and we're seeing where, and it's kind of great to see their journey. Um, there's also iNaturalist observations. We, we use those as well. And if you're interested, you can look at the greatlakespipingplover.org website where we have um, different blog posts, our Facebook group. Um, we'll give updates as well. And you can post there, message us there. Um, and kind of watch videos and learn everything about piping plovers. So I think that's all I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Fantastic, thanks Jillian. Um, I will just remind you all, if you have questions, you can add those to the Q&A box on Zoom or in the comments section on Facebook. Um, we do have a couple of questions, so we'll get started with those. Um, Someone is wondering if you can tell the birds from the three different populations apart, like the Great Plains, Great Lakes, and Atlantic. That's a great question. So our birds from the Great Lakes, they have an orange band and or this flag band that you can kind of see on this bird. So Great Lakes, we use orange. So the other populations, I believe um, the Atlantic coast, I believe is white. Don't quote me. I have to double check. I don't see them that often. Um, and then the Great Plains, I believe, is yellow. So that's how we're able to distinguish the ones that are banded. But if we were to get an unbanded bird in the Great Lakes, we would assume that they're a Great Lakes bird, um, but we wouldn't know for sure. But then we'd ban them and we claim them as a, a Great Lakes bird. But that's a great question. Awesome. Um, what's the average lifespan of a plover? And is it different for a captive reared bird? So on average, it's typically five to six years but we do have some older birds. We have, I think, old man plover is one of the 
the names of our birds. And I think that he is 15, but I believe he's wild, but we currently have a male at Muskegon. He's captive reared and he is 10 years old. So I think it can just um, vary. I think if they were to only stay in captive rearing, I think that they would live longer than the average wild piping plover. Um, but on average, I don't think um, captive reared birds live longer than uh, wild fledged birds. Cool. Um, what about mating? Do the pairs mate for life or do they get new partners each season? It's a great drama filled question. So, uh, we do sometimes see piping plovers that they have success in previous years. We will see them um, potentially come back to the same site. Typically both partners will come back to the same site. Um, so they don't necessarily mate for life, but they do typically um, try to seek out the same partner if it is con not convenient, but sometimes it works that way. And sometimes it doesn't. We, if some bird doesn't get to a site in time, then like if a male gets there and the female from last year didn't and a different female comes through, um, he might partner up with her. So um, it just kind of depends on who's there and hopefully that they get there at the same time. I'm dreading the day if uh, a different male or female comes from Monte or Rose. Uh, I don't wanna see that drama unfold. Uh, a crazy thing that we have been seeing in recent years is um, the males have done extra copulations with single females. So before I was in my position, we had a male skewed population. So we had more males than we had females. And so um, not, so we just didn't have as many nests as what we potentially could. And so now it seems that our population is slightly skewed to have uh, more females than we do males. Um, and as a result, the males kind of have a wandering eye sometimes and they'll start uh, copulating with an additional female. But like I was saying, this um, piping clovers require both parents to incubate the nest. Um, one parent will be on typically for like a two hour shift, they'll switch, the other one will go forage, they'll switch back and forth. And so it's really hard, if not impossible, um, for a piping clover to raise um, a clutch of eggs by their own. So we have had drama already in fold this year in Wisconsin. Uh, we've had three, three males at a site. However, we have six nests. So I think one of the males has produced three nests with three different females, um, which is unprecedented. And we are still trying to figure out the dynamics among that to try to figure out who needs to go to captive rearing or what we're able to do with the wild population to do what's best for the piping clovers. So it can be a telenovela piping clover edition uh, for sure in a given season. Yeah, who knew birds were so dramatic, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so someone else is asking about their diet. What is their diet? So they'll typically in uh, the Great Lakes, they'll eat um, kind of flies, they'll eat just kind of insects on the shore. Um, I've seen them eat earthworms. I have a great picture of one just slurping down one up here. Um, also Hymenoptera, they'll eat some, some of those kind of uh, invertebrates. So occasionally they'll eat bivalves, um, but they'll also be, um, seen down in uh, wintering grounds, eating like polychaete worms or marine worms. So they, they primarily eat invertebrates. Um, how long do the captive bred birds stay in the outside pens before they're released into the wild? Great question. So we typically aim to have them be around 40 grams prior to them releasing. So none of the birds are released um, before they're 24 days old. Um, so that's when we consider them to be fledged. Um, if we're seeing them fly around, we, and they're above that weight threshold and we're able to have a good weather day and there's other similarly aged chicks, then we release them. So typically it's after at least 30 days, we typically have them in a captive bearing facility, um, but it can be as many as 40. Great. So I'm just checking to see if there are other questions. I'm not seeing any more right now. Um, so if you have other questions, feel free to type them in really quick for us. Um, but while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions, I do want to mention that, because um, Jillian did mention it in passing, but we do have a piping clover monitor at Whitefish Point. And so um, he is there and actively monitoring for those. Um, last I heard, there were no official pairs. Um, but 
we still got time. They're a little bit later in the season <laughs> for, for um, obvious reasons when you start to think about um, the, the weather up there. But um, so there is a pipe and plover monitor on staff to be able to watch for those. Um, and if you do visit the point, you will see um, those, you know, roped off sections and exposures and all those great things um, if and when we do have a nest. So something to be prepared for. Um, and uh, if you are, you know, planning a trip to the point, it's a great opportunity to try and see one of the piping plovers. Um, and so, you know, we encourage you to check them out. There are not as many pairs up there at the point as there are in some of the other places, but we do love our piping plovers. So we're happy to share them with everyone who comes to, um, comes to visit. So, um, all right. So another question while I was talking, which was what I was really hoping here. Um, <laughs> in one of the earlier slides, it showed a few yellow non-breeding dots in Chicago. Does that mean that they didn't migrate south for the winter? Um, that may actually be the birds from like the apostles in Wisconsin passing through on their way back from the breeding grounds. We did have some birds stop over in like Waukegan, the Waukegan area on their way back down south. So um, all the birds are smart and know to avoid a Midwest winter and they go where it's warm. So no one, no one stuck around up here. But great question. Sorry, I'm switching back and forth between Facebook and Zoom. So then I mute myself so I don't accidentally, you know, talk in the middle of it. But um, cool. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, again, we'll take them. Um, but I would like to also offer um, for everyone who's watching, because this is part of our series um, celebrating all of the research and monitoring efforts happening, happening at Whitefish Point Bird Observatory. If you are interested in supporting Whitefish Point Bird Observatory, our annual fundraiser Birdathon um, will actually be happening this weekend. So our counters count. You pledge money per species, um, and yeah, we all kind of win, right? Um, so if you're interested in Birdathon, there is information available on Facebook and also on our website at wpbo.org. Um, just for example, last year the counters were able to count 166 species um, during their birdathon count for the day. So um, that's a good indication of what we hope they'll also count this sometime this weekend. So um, if you want to learn more about that, you can do so on Facebook or through um, the website at wpbo.org. And again, wpbo.org has a lot more information about all the programs that are happening at the point. So um, we encourage you to kind of check those out as well. Um, so um, not seeing any other questions at this moment. Um, I will say thank you to Jillian for being here. We really appreciate having you. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, enjoy the rest of your night and uh, we hope you learned something new. Thanks everybody.